I think the recruitment was a success. So I have to say, this has uh, been the, the most passionate team of this evening uh, to go out and say, you have to listen to this story. And, uh, and on the way here, uh, Charlotte was explaining me uh, um, what this talk is about. So uh, this talk is about doing uh, uh, new things using bacteria. Well, it's actually doing two things. First of all, using bacteria as a laser. And second, uh, if I understood correctly, as a uh, microscope, as a lens, as a lens, as a lightweight lens. Uh, and they will explain all the details. What is interesting to know, they are competing in an international uh, competition with about 300 teams from all over the world. They consist uh, of very diverse. Um, we're waiting for the music to, to go down, but the diversity is in the fact that there's very different engineers working together in the team. We have another teammate joining here. I think, there, how, how much are you? 10 people working together. So I think uh, we set the stage now for uh, Charlotte and Carmen to tell their story. Please give them a, a very warm welcome. Is it on so, now? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Marino. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, showing up at this late hour tonight because uh, some people already went home, I think, and it's really brave of you guys that you're still here listening to a story <coughs> about bacteria, which is not the usual technology you'll probably hear about today. Um, so my name is Charlotte and this is Carmen, and today we'll tell you something about our project, which is uh, making lasers and lenses with bacteria. So actually fading the line between usual technology and biotechnology. Um, well, before I tell anything about our project, I would like to know what brought you guys here. Um, our title was Bacteria Shooting Lasers. Pointer? Yeah. Bacteria Shooting Lasers. Um, and <coughs> we were wondering, why are you here? Are you here because A, <laughs> you think bacteria shooting lasers are awesome and they're the technology of the future? B, you are afraid of bacteria and their potentials. C, pure curiosity, always good. Or D, you're not supposed to be here and you just figured out that this is not the innovation stage. So let's show some hands. Who goes for A? <laughs> That's already quite some hands. It's nice. Who goes for B? No one. That's really good to know. That's really good to know. Who's for C? That's also nice because you're definitely going to learn a lot today. <coughs> and who's for D? <laughs> e? What's E? <laughs> and of course, my team members. But they have to be here. <laughs> well, it's really good to see that a lot of you are actually interested in bacteria and not afraid of them because that's a very usual response we get. A lot of people associate bacteria with getting sick or nasty diseases and we don't want that because we think bacteria are awesome they have a great potential and we will show you that in the coming presentation a quick outline we'll first tell something about our team what do we do and why are we here uh, second of all um, some of you might be uh, already familiar with the concept of synthetic biology but some of you might not so we would first like to introduce the concept of synthetic biology which is what we do to you um, if you are already know a lot about synthetic biology, please bear with us because uh, this introduction is for the people who don't know it. Because after that, we'll go to our project. We'll tell you something about the biological uh, lasers and lenses. And in the end, we would like to show or see a little more hands to know and see what you guys think of synthetic biology and what you guys think of our project. <laughs> because that information is really valuable to us. So Carmen will first of all tell you something about our team and about the competition we're taking part in. Yeah, good evening. Um, as you already heard, we are from the ITEM team of the TU Delft. And uh, the ITEM competition is all about synthetic biology. And uh, since there are more than 300 teams that participate in this competition every year from universities from all over the world, it's the largest competition about synthetic biology. And the most special thing about it is that it's a completely open source competition. So that means that um, there are, for example, no patents and that all the information you have and all the results you have to 
published on your website. So therefore, all the information is available for everyone, which of course very useful for example, uh, research purposes. Uh, and eventually we will all go, so all the teams will go to uh, Boston, which of course very nice for our students, and we will present there our results. And uh, hopefully uh, the judges will like us project this year again, and we will so win some awards. So some good examples from uh, previous uh, ISEM teams are, the, for example, the team of 2013. Uh, they uh, designed a bacteria that is able to detect landmines. So you can imagine that this is uh, yeah, much easier to detect uh, landmines with bacteria instead of, uh, for example, dogs. And we hope that in the future we are really able to do this. The team of 2012 was able to design a yeast that really can detect tuberculosis, which is, of course, a terrible disease. And the team of last year made a 3D printer out of Knex. That's the toy mostly for children. Maybe you use it as well. And uh, with that uh, 3D printer, they can print um, biofilms. And with that project, they became world champion. So they've set the bar very high for us. But of course, we are going to try to make a great project again this year. And hopefully, we will uh, clear this bar. Uh, how are we going to do this? As you already heard, we are with a very uh, interdisciplinary team. Uh, we are, for example, both biotechnology students. We do have students from nanobiology, from aerospace engineering, but also from mechanical engineering. So uh, we do have a very diverse team, and we hope we can combine all our knowledge uh, yeah, to make a great project again. And this project this year is about biolasers, uh, biolenses and biolasers. So, and as already said, we will explain uh, the details about you later in this project. But first, some yeah, s simple things, some basic things about synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is, and this is again a question for you, and we hope you know the answer already, a way of plastic surgery. Maybe it's giving new functions to organisms in a systematic way. Is it, do you think, uh, making art with microorganisms? Sounds cool, of course. Or is it creating a new system of classification of bacteria? So who thinks it's uh, A, <laughs> wave plastic surgery? Okay, nobody, that's good to hear. Uh, who thinks it's answer B? That are most people, I think. And who thinks answer C? Nobody again. Or answer D, we only have left. Also a few people. Well, the right answer is indeed uh, answer B, as the most people already said. Uh, it's the uh, giving new functions to organisms in a systematic way. Or to be more exact, it is the design and construction of novel artificial biological pathways, organisms or devices, or redesign of existing natural biological system. So this is a really complicated sentence, and therefore I'm going to explain it in a little more detail to you. The first part is about uh, new products uh, and pathways uh, to introduce them in bacteria. A good example of this is uh, the introduction of the insulin pathway uh, in bacteria. In the early days, we were used to get uh, the required insulin for diabetes patients uh, from, among other cows. And you can imagine that this is hard and uh, expensive, but also it appears that uh, the insulin was relatively impure. And nowadays, we are able to produce it with bacteria. And that's much easier, cheaper, and we can also make it much more purified. So that's a good example of synthetic biology. The second part of the sentence is about the redesign of organisms. So uh, in a good example of this is the production of ethanol. Um, there are organisms that naturally produce ethanol. And for example, we could use this ethanol uh, as a biofuel, so as an alternative for the fossil resources we currently use. However, most of these naturally producing organisms do not produce enough ethanol, so the yield of the uh, ethanol is too low. And with synthetic biology, uh, you can try to increase this yield. So you can try to uh, yeah, let the bacteria make more ethanol. So this is the second thing, optimizing pro already existing pathways of organisms. So these are both good examples of what we could do with synthetic biology, I think. But how are we doing this? Well, to do this, um, yeah, we have to alter the DNA of the organisms. And probably a lot of you uh, have some classes about synthetic of about uh, DNA during high school, or maybe if you see the uh, movie Jurassic Park. 
but probably for a lot of you it's already a long time ago uh, they heard something about DNA so we're gonna explain some things in uh, yeah, really some basic things about DNA so this is a schematic representation of a DNA molecule and as you can see it's a long spiral molecule that consists of four bases respectively A, T, C and G and these bases always form pairs so A is always with T and C is always with G and it appears that every living organism in the world has m billions of these bases and it, the combination of these bases is unique for everyone so when you look to your neighbor uh, the fact that you are different from each other is because the combination of bases you have is different. So therefore we can say that DNA is a, actually a blueprint of life. But how can this molecule act as a blueprint for such complex creatures such as we are or trees, maybe rabbits or even your potato plant? They all consist because of the fact they have DNA. Before we can answer that question, I first have a little uh, fun fact question about DNA. So please raise again your hands if you think you know the answer. And what is the length of a DNA molecule present in one cell of your body? So maybe you think that's two micrometers. Is that two millimeters? Two meters? Or even the last option, which is really, really long. So raise your hands if you think it's A. B maybe then? <laughs> answer C? Ah, that's what the most people think. And answer D? No, sorry guys, that's really too long. Uh, the answer is C. And it's still quite a long molecule and it even means that if you for example would take all the DNA we do have in a human body, you could go 6,000 times to the moon and back. So yeah, that's really a long of a lot of DNA we do have in our body. So coming back on the question, uh, how can yeah, such a molecule act as uh, a blueprint of life? Well, that's actually because uh, of amino acids. When we um, think about the bases, as we already said, we do have billions of them, and it appears that, as we call them, these letters of DNA, for example, the combination G, C, and T, can code for so-called amino acids. And these amino acids are tiny linear chemicals. We have around 20 of them, and they all have different shapes and different properties, therefore. And they often considered to be the building blocks of life because, uh, yeah, for the life on Earth, these are maybe the most important molecules there are. So when we compare them to legal bricks, we can explain to you uh, how it works. Because it appears that what you can do with amino acids, you can stack them together in order to create larger molecules. And we call this larger molecule of proteins. So proteins are actually a lot of amino acids stacked together. And depending on the combination of amino acids you have, you will get proteins with different shapes and properties, and they can have different functions, therefore. For example, protein can have a function to be a building block of a cell. You can imagine a cell is surrounded by a cell wall, so proteins can be part of that. But they can also be uh, the motors or uh, have certain specific functions inside the cell. So these proteins, together with a lot of other chemicals, can form cells. And when we have billions of these cells together, you can build an organism, such as a human being. So that's actually how DNA works. That is why it is the blueprint of life. So a little recap, we do have DNA, which we consider as the blueprint of life, and that's because uh, DNA codes for amino acids. And with these amino acids, when you stick them together, you can form proteins. And these proteins eventually form cells, and billions of these cells together can form uh, organisms such as human beings. So, and genetic engineering is all about uh, altering this DNA. As you can imagine, when you change the DNA, this will result in different amino acids, and therefore you will get proteins with different properties. So when you do this, you can maybe imagine that you, for example, can change the futures or, of an organism, or even give it new properties. So you may think this is a really complex process, and actually it is really complex. So we are wondering, what do you think? How long are we already consciously engineering organisms? Is that maybe only for a few years because it is so complex? Maybe we're doing this for a few decades? Already over a century? 
or have we already done this in the Middle Ages? So please raise your hands again if you think it's answer A. Nobody thinks that? Answer B? Answer C? Already some people? Or answer D? Yeah, it is actually answer C, of, of course, at least as we know. Uh, in the already the 18th century, we saw some examples of uh, so-called classical engineering. And some very uh, simple examples of this are, uh, for example, the selection of crops. Farmers always choose the crop with the most, uh, yeah, the properties they like the most. So when you do this, you actually choose certain crops with specific genetic information inside it. And you can imagine that if you do this cycle and cycle again, you slowly will change the properties and therefore the genetic information of your crop. So this is the first example of what we call classical genetic engineering. A second relatively simple example is directed evolution. And we see this uh, with purebred dogs, for example. Uh, purebred dogs, a lot of people like them for some reason. And what we have seen that over the years, uh, the same as has happened with the crops, the properties of the do dogs slowly have been altered. And yeah, sometimes that has also resulted in some unwanted side effects. For example, as you can see here, the dog on the right side of the image, I think it's much uglier than the one of the left side. And as probably most of you also know, uh, a lot of uh, purebred dogs have some diseases uh, with them. So when we think about synthetic biology, uh, you can say, well, were the previous examples are really synthetic biology? And then the answer is clearly no, because the farmers and maybe uh, for the dogs, we have no idea what is really happening with the DNA of them. And since uh, synthetic biology is all about changing the DNA in a systematic way. But when you think about what is synthetic biology, it appears that a lot of researchers do not agree about this. And, uh, yeah, we hope we can make this clear. Uh, this is an answer from a professor which is uh, yeah, very uh, important in this field of research. And he said actually that uh, synthetic biology is like rhinography and you know it when you see it. So he also thinks there's not really a clear answer when it's something, something really synthetic biology and when it's it maybe even yeah, a form of classical engineering. But there are a few things uh, about which all researchers do agree about what synthetic biology is. And that is that it is, uh, of course, a way of altering DNA, but then in a very directed and systematic way. So what we saw in the example of the crops, this is really not systematic. But when you're really introducing the pathway of insulin in a bacteria, you can maybe already say this is systematic. So when we think about synthetic biology, we really think about applying engineering uh, principles to biology. We try to combine the engineer principles we see in many research field with the biology principles. And of course, there are a lot of pros and cons about it, and I would like to discuss a few with you. Uh, as you maybe can imagine, synthetic biology is very directed, and you do not have the unwanted mutations, which we, for example, saw with the purebred dogs. And you can also standardize it, so you can uh, do it much faster and it becomes much easier to do. And therefore, there are an infinite number of applications for it. However, when you talk about synthetic biology and maybe also about uh, classical genetic engineering, a lot of people have some safety concerns about it. They think, for example, that a bioterrorist could use uh, synthetic biology for, uh, to make a virus that's very deadly or that uh, new crops are bad for the environment. However, we do think that synthetic biology has a lot of possibilities and we hope we uh, can show you that with our projects. So Finally, the moment you all came for. Um, our project, the bio lasers and the bio lenses. Um, well, as you all uh, know, bio, or at least lasers and lenses are very, are objects. They're technology and you can touch them, you can feel them, you know what they're like. Cells aren't that easy. They're harder to understand, they're alive, up as up, uh, opposed to uh, lenses and lasers. And how do you actually combine the two? Well, the answer is in synthetic biology. And our main question for our research is how can we use synthetic biology to produce biological lenses and lasers? Or simply put, how can we use those standardized parts to actually 
let a uh, bacterium shoot a laser? And how can we use uh, these standardized parts to make a lens out of a bacteria? Well, first of all, as you can all imagine, you'll need light. And uh, for this, we'll first need to light up the cell. And this sounds really hard, actually, but it's actually really easy. It's a concept uh, that we've known for many years already, and it's called fluorescence. I will click quick you, uh, quickly tell you um, the simple basics about fluorescence, because it's essential to understand them if you want to know what a biological laser is like. Well, the idea of fluorescence is that um, you have a fluorescent protein. We just discussed what proteins are. And these are special proteins because when you shoot a photon or a light particle on this protein, the protein will absorb the photon. It will keep it, and we call this an excited protein. This means that the protein uh, has absorbed the photon and is therefore in a very energized state. So we have this uh, protein here full of energy, but the uh, protein can't hold on to that energy. The, proton, uh, the protein has to release the energy again. And this is what happens here, and we call that emission. And uh, this is the protein, and it emits a photon again. It cannot hold on to the photon, so it throws it away. And uh, we can see this as fluorescence or as a protein that's giving light. Uh, as you notice, the color is a bit different because there's always a little bit of energy lost. So the color that the protein emits is always different from the light that the protein takes up. So uh, we call this spontaneous emission because uh, you shoot, for example, red light on the proteins, but they can emit dark red, purple, pink. The light will always change a little. Um, and we can also do this in cells. Uh, step one is, first of all, to express the DNA because, as we just heard, we need DNA to express a protein. This DNA will then uh, make sure that there are the fluorescent proteins in the cell. Then we should light at the cell. The proteins will take up this light and get excited. They keep up uh, or they keep all the energy and uh, store it. But at one point, the proteins cannot hold on to the energy any longer and they release it as light. And um, can you see this? Well, you can under a microscope. Uh, so, basic little recap, we need DNA, DNA becomes proteins, proteins get excited, proteins are no longer excited and emit light, and it looks a little like this. You can get these pretty pictures uh, where a cell is actually emitting light. You cannot see this by the bare eye, but you can see it under a microscope, and it's, it's a really nice way of visualizing cells. You can also do it with real bigger organisms. These are, for example, chickens. Uh, they can actually save these chickens by uh, making them fluorescent because uh, often baby, baby hens are killed off because they're not useful. And by, for example, it looks really sad, a chicken like this, but actually it saves life. Um, well, now we know what fluorescence is. We have to go to step two. We have to understand what a laser is because we don't want fluorescent cells. People have already done that years ago. We want a biological laser. So the laser starts with the same principle as fluorescence. We have a fluorescent protein and we have a photon that is shot at the protein to excite it. But there's one major difference now. The proteins are in between mirrors and these mirrors are a special kind of mirrors that can only uh, let through a special kind of light. So we got the proteins again. They get excited by the photon, which we see here. And then again, this protein emits the photon again. So it emits light. But because we have those mirrors, the photons can get out. They won't reach the eye. They will just stay there and bounce back. And they will bounce back to the neighboring protein which they will also excite, and the protein will also uh, gain energy. And the trick is that we keep shining light on these so they won't fall back. They will keep the energy and shoot another photon. And this photon will again bounce back. And this will keep going on and on and on until all proteins in the little mirror cavity are excited. Uh, and the light reaches a certain kind of energy and a certain kind of wavelength. And this is exactly the energy and the wavelength that this mirror can let through uh, 
let through the material, and we see a laser. And an important thing to notice is that this is stimulated emission, and the special thing about this kind of light is that it only has one wavelength, it has only uh, one type of polarization, it has one frequency, and it has one direction. That's also why when I point this laser pointer on the screen, you only see the little dot and not a wide beam of light. I will take questions after the presentation. Is that okay? <laughs> it's also a little like pornography. Yes, definitely. Um, so we have uh, this kind of, it's important to remember this because this is the only light the mirrors let through. So then we have a laser. I just showed it. But now we have a laser, like a laser pointer. And we want to know how do we get a laser cell how do we make a cell do this using, using biology? So, step three, we're gonna combine what we just learned about the laser plus what we know about cells. So I want a little recap. You can shout things at me because I want to know. We need four things to make a biological laser. Does anyone have a clue? Sorry? A photon, yes. Proteins, yes. A mirror, yes. And one more essential thing, a cell, exactly. Oh, it's correct in one go, nice. So we need cells, fluorophore or the protein, something to excite the proteins, which is the photon, and something to reflect the proteins. So this is kind of easy for us because cells, we are biologists, we know a lot about cells and we know that E. coli is perfect for this. You might know E. coli from the bacteria that, it's, uh, that is in your guts. You may also know it as the bacteria that when you eat rotten meat, it's often in there and you get sick. But these are nice type of E. coli. We'll keep them in the lab so no one will get sick. Um, we need a fluorophore. Those are the fluorescent proteins you just mentioned. We need an excitation source, something to shoot photons. And this can just be light because light contains photons. But we need a reflection. And um, since we cannot, since we don't want to use real life mirrors because we want to make biological lasers and not the lasers that already exist in our laser pointer, we need a biological type of mirror. So we looked a bit into the possibilities. What kind of biological mirrors are there and which ones can we use? And we found two alternatives, two types of biological mirrors. Well, the first one uh, is glass but then biological glass, also called polysilicate. You can see it here, this cell is covered in polysilicate. It's the yeah, little layer you see around the cell. And as you see, this polysilicate covers the whole cell. So when we use this one, we will speak about the whole cell laser because the whole cell will become the laser. There's also bioplastic. Plastic also reflects, so we might as well use that. Um, for this, we use a very common bioplastic, so a plastic that can be produced by bacteria, which is PHB. And you see them here in these little granules. They're stored inside the cell. And we figured um, those might also reflect light. So we call them the intracellular laser because the PHB doesn't get out of the cell. It stays in there, as you can see here. So how are we going to do this? Well. Poss poss uh, possibly you can already link the pieces together with what you've just heard and what I just told you about the uh, uh, biomirrors. First of all, we need to make the fluorescent cell. I just explained how to do that. Then we have to express DNA, which encodes for uh, a protein. And this protein is called silicatein. And this uh, enzyme is actually able to make a little glass layer around the cell. So when we express this protein, it goes out of the cell and it will make uh, a little glass layer. So called polysilicate. So we have now a cell covered in polysilicate and I hope you can already link the pieces together. We have our mirror, we have our uh, proteins in there. We have light that shines on the cell. So there's only one possible outcome we hope and that's the bio laser. The photons will resonate within the cell and when they reach a high enough energy and a high enough wavelength, they will come out as a laser out of the cell. And if you do this, it looks something like this, which is a really nice picture and already much better than many of the fluorescent images uh, you usually see. 
But then we also have the intracellular laser. How can we do this? We start again with the fluorescent cell, which is again easy to make, <laughs> no big deal. But now we put in DNA, and this DNA will make sure that the cell expresses the little bubble of plastic inside the cell, which we call PHB. This PHB bubble grows, and uh, um, we'll try to trap the, the proteins, the fluorescent proteins, in the bubble of PHB. So again, you can already link the pieces. We have our mirror, we have our fluorescent proteins, we have the light shining on it, we have a laser. So these are, uh, this is the second way in which we hope to approach uh, the biological laser. And this will look something like this, <coughs> which is also an even nicer picture than the previous one. So this is a really cool subject and I can go on uh, for hours on how to do this and what the possibilities are, what the physics is about it. But the most important question in technology is why? Why would we want to make a cellular laser? I mean, we already have one in laser pointers. Um, why do we need bacteria that shoot lasers? Well, first of all, knowledge is power. We want to have more knowledge. And um, with this project, we can um, get uh, images of cells in a higher resolution. We can uh, do more colors at the same time and we can see what's going on in the cell and when this is going on and how this is going on and you might think why would you want to look into a cell or multiple cells well for example in cancer research it's extremely important to see what's going on because you don't want to kill off the wrong cell you want to kill the right cell and therefore it's extremely important to visualize exactly what's going on in which cell furthermore uh, we're also doing this because this the if this completely works, this is the first fully biological laser ever. And I already saw some of you guys thinking, but you just showed two pictures of bio lasers, right? I just so showed the two pictures. That's true, but those people were cheating because they either injected the fluorophores or they uh, artificially made uh, the little coating around it or whatever. And uh, what we want to do is to let the cell make this bubble by itself or let the cell coat its own cell. So we don't, we just modify the cell and after that we're done. The cell does the rest by himself. And if this works, we would be the first to uh, achieve this, which is um, quite an achievement. Lastly, it's very safe. Um, I, when I talk about this uh, project with a lot of people, the first thing they're concerned about is but don't we get bacteria running around in the wild, shooting lasers? They see this whole kind of apocalypse. That's not true. First of all, we need to shine light on the lasers, and this light is stronger than sunlight. So when, uh, when those, even if those bacteria got out in the wild and they start overpopulating the world, no one would see the difference from a regular E. coli cell, which are actually everywhere, even in your own gut. And on the other side, we use lab strains. They're not really uh, dangerous because as soon as they get out of the lab, they are killed by the wild E. coli strains, which are much stronger. So we would be really happy if we achieved this, and uh, we think this would be a really cool outcome and a really cool application, but we are uh, engineers. We are from a University of Technology, and in the end, we're always interested in making money and making a product, and we figured, the silicatine we put around, uh, or the silicate layer we put around the cell to resonate uh, the protons, it's actually glass. And, you know, glass is everywhere. Uh, glass has a lot of applications. So can we also use this to maybe make a product? Because in the end, science only isn't the final goal. We also want the world to, um, the world to enjoy it. And uh, since we are biotechnologists, we always want the best for our world. We want to change it and everyone's happy. So we decided to find a product that's expensive, which is bad for the environment, and is not bio-based yet. And this product are lenses. Um, you might not think of it right away. Why would you want to make lenses? Is that even interesting? Well, some, I see a lot of people with glasses. When you go to the optician, how much do they charge you for a, a pair of glasses? Pretty much, right? So um, you can even imagine that when we use microscopes, we use 
far more specialized lenses. And these lenses, they're super expensive, they're super hard to make, and their production process is bad for the environment. So we decided, while we're at it, why not make biological lenses? So step four of our project is make a lens. Um, well, what do we know about lenses? They're made of glass. We've got the covers. They reflect light. This will probably happen when you shine light on it, obviously. And they're either round or elliptical. Well, these two we've already covered. The third one uh, is quite a challenge, but it's still doable. So, how do you make a biological lens? Step one is, again, to take a cell. This time, we're not putting any fancy fluorescent proteins in it because we don't need that. Step two is we put some DNA in it, and there's actually only one gene that you can put in a cell to make it perfectly round. So that's really great. It's even easy. And step three is cover the cell in silicatine. Um, with this, you have the uh, lens kind of shape. Uh, it's round. It's covered in glass, and it uh, should function as a lens. So when you shine light on it, uh, it's supposed to uh, do something like this. So. How can we actually use these micro lenses? Because it's really cool to make a lens of one micrometer in size, but are they even useful? Well, yes, they are. First of all, uh, in optical and medical in industry, we won't immediately make a lens that is large enough to put in your glasses, <laughs> but we will make a lens that is probably large enough to use in 3D screens, in uh, biosensors, or in um, compact optical devices. So. Just imagine really tiny microscopes which, with which we can image really tiny things. And most important of all, they're very cheap and waste friendly. And since uh, lenses are very expensive, we um, figured that this way, I mean, we can do it. We're an underfunded student project. Uh, this way, lenses could be available for everyone who wants to do complicated science, um, which is usually really expensive. And we call this the so-called DIY by technology. Do it yourself, don't buy something from the large companies, but you can do it yourself because it's pretty easy and pretty cheap. So that's basically the outline of our project. And even though the response towards synthetic biology was already really positive in this room, which is really nice, um, we still would like to see if your opinion changed or that it's uh, even better or worse. So I'm wondering, what do you think now? I think that bio lenses and lasers are A, very interesting and have good future perspectives. B, they're still super scary. Hopefully no one thinks it now. C, I believe that the traditional approaches are much better. Or D, still not sure. So who's going for A? Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Thanks. Who's going for B? That's also very good. Who's going for C? Okay. Can have a talk later? Sorry? At the moment, yeah, we can have a talk later. <laughs> or D, I'm not sure. <laughs> you can join in our talk. <laughs> okay, well, I'm very happy to see that the response on synthetic biology really changed into a positive way. We would like to ask a few more questions. It's also important for us to uh, know what people think about uh, biotechnology, especially people who are not really into biotechnology. So Carmen is gonna ask you a few more questions. Yeah, hopefully you are going to join us uh, for one minute to answer some questions we can use for our own research. And the first uh, question is a general question about synthetic biology. What do you think about it? Uh, do you, for example, think it should be completely banned? Maybe it should be strictly regulated and it is only available uh, for people who are uh, authorized to it. So, for example, only for researchers. Or do you think it should be public available, so the do-it-yourself biotechnology, everyone should be able to do this? Or, yeah, I don't care. So who thinks answer A is the right one? Chaos biotechnologies, we like this, of course. Uh, who thinks answer B is the best option? It's uh, some people. Maybe there are also uh, for people for answer C. Or D, I don't care. Well, most people at least have an opinion about it. Uh, the second question is about when would you use SynBio applications? Would you, for example, only use it uh, for life-saving purposes, uh, such as cancer medicines? And if you uh, think I would use it for this, just raise your hand now. <laughs> uh, 
maybe you use it for cosmetic applications or even in food or would you never use it so we uh, who thinks he will use it for life-saving applications such as for cancer medication yeah then most people of course gonna use it for cosmetic applications well already quite some people uh, who don't mind if there are products uh, with a sound bio background in their food and are there people who would never use this kind of applications no Okay, then the last question, what do you think that is the future of synthetic biology? Do you think uh, there is no future for it, so people never gonna like it? Maybe you think it will only remain in the lab, so uh, for example, our project will never go to the market. It will result in many useful applications, or do you think it's the solution for everything? So uh, please raise your hands for A, for B, who thinks it's answer C? <laughs> of course, most people. And are there people who think it's the solution for everything? Well, uh, some final words. Uh, of course, we think, uh, yeah, synthetic biology in general, we have to take safety uh, into account about it, and we have to think about uh, what is synthetic biology doing for the world. And so, therefore, we uh, think policy and practice is an important uh, aspect of our research. And we do, for example, take safety in account, look into ethical issues, but also talk to many experts to know what they think about our project. And in the lab, uh, we do have many safety protocols, so uh, there are yeah, not that much of a risk. There's something going wrong. And of course, uh, in Europe, there are already quite some laws and rules about it. So thank you for your time and to yeah. listen to us. Yeah, I would like to thank a few more people. Uh, first of all, the bio nanoscience department uh, who is hosting us. Uh, TU Delft's uh, Department of Biotechnology and the Faculty of Applied Science are also working together with us, which is nice. These are Snap team. And we think science is the best when it's shared. And um, we're looking for any kind of collaboration. If you think you can do something with this kind of uh, technologies, please contact us because uh, we are very exciting to expand our field and work together with a lot of people, a lot of researchers, a lot of companies. So please do so. And if you have any questions, um, we'll be happy to answer them now. Or uh, you can always email us, find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're basically on every social media. And um, thank you very much for your uh, interest in this late hour in uh, our bio lenses. A very big applause. I'm, uh, I'm first going to ask the team how proud they are. Well, very proud. Very <laughs> nice to see. Yeah, right? uh, so, uh, any questions in the room? I see one here. Uh, I may be mistaken, but uh, with fluorescence, isn't it so that the wavelength of the light becomes uh, greater if it's emitted by uh, fluorescence? Yeah. So. Uh, so the energy uh, potential uh, per photon will be lower, not higher, and the purple light or violet light uh, will become redshifted, not the other way around. Yeah, maybe we used the wrong kind of colors. So it's probably <laughs> not scientifically correct, but <laughs> we were not <laughs> expecting a lot okay. of uh, <laughs> fluorescence experts in the room, actually. <laughs> and um, the, the point we wanted to show with our picture was that the one, the lights coming in is different than the lights that's coming out. So, you, <laughs> yeah. Kun, that uh, what is your background, Kun? <laughs> we should change this. Uh, I'm studying uh, applied chemistry at uh, yeah. University of Applied Sciences here in Utrecht. So, do you think yeah. maybe you could collaborate on this project? <laughs> um, um, maybe not spe specifically me, but maybe the life science students uh, at the, my uh, institute. That might be interesting. Uh, any other questions? Maybe the sir that was saying not yet. There's mm. someone over there? You, yes. Oh. <laughs> About that, uh, that is better than traditional lenses. Wait, I'll coming to you. It will only take a minute, don't worry. Yeah, when you said lenses, my first thought was, you know, camera lenses. Yeah. And of course, I mean, it would be really if you if apparently it, you can make a single cell be very round yeah. it would be even cooler if you could have you know a bunch of cells be really round yeah that's actually the next step of we would first want to try 
if we can make it so, if we can make uh, a single cellular lens, because you always have to start at the smallest and the easiest scale, and then slowly work up to your final product. And our first, um, uh, yeah, we first want to try if we can make this single cell lens, but uh, if that works, you could, for example, make a large community of bacteria, use a uh, biofilm, it's called, and um, see if they can also make some kind of shapes, because in theory, it's even possible to grow a lens on these bacteria, because they can basically assemble pieces of glass. So if they can assemble a very small piece of glass, they probably also can assemble a very large one. But we first want to try and see if they, we can get the small ones before we uh, go big. Nice. Wait, I'll come to you. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody can hear. And you're about to say something very smart. Why is it a laser? Why doesn't it just photo emit in any direction? Because of the um, like the photons, they have a certain because of, yeah, it's the sorry, it's the what is it called the stimulated emission. Sorry, I lost the word. And uh, this means that the photons all have um, the same kind of energy, and the uh, uh, the, the the proteins also are lifted into the same energy level and they keep this energy and all of the photons that are emitted again they have the same kind of energy and the same kind of uh, wavelength because they are emitted together and um, well there might be a possibility that because we have a round cell and usually lasers have the slits that makes light that it will go all or more directions but um, the fir our first goal is to achieve lasing, like the, the concept of a laser in a cell. And then we can maybe figure out how we can direct it. But we first want to try if we can let these protons resonate inside the cell and see if we can actually make this laser. Okay, we have one more question over here. Okay, I didn't really understand because you said that when you were explaining how the laser worked and you had the mirrors, you said that the mirrors only let one wavelength through. So that's why you had like a laser of just one wavelength. But then when you had it in the cell, you said that you expect light to go through, obviously, at yeah. a different wavelength that you expect it to go out. How, so how does that work? Because it's obviously letting through different wavelengths. Like you mean the, the light that is going in and then the light that is emitted? Well, because uh, the, a bit of energy is lost in the process. So it's always, because the basis is fluorescence. And in fluorescence, uh, a certain energy of light goes in, and a slightly higher wavelength comes out. And basically the same happens, but then on a much larger scale. So the wavelength that is going out, so the light that is emitted, is slightly different than the light is that's going in. So that's how we can. Separate. So the so the glass lets every wavelength through. Yeah, basically, but um, because of the shape and because of the uh, refractive index, we call it, it's uh, how much light is actually going through and how much light is bounced back. Um, all the light that's going inside the cell is also expected to, a part of it will go out again and a part of it will bounce back within the cell, keeps exciting all these uh, uh, proteins, and then uh, the laser will form. So a part of it is indeed going in and out again, but a part of it will stay in the cell because of the properties of the silicatein that's around the cell. What is your background? Um, biotech. Nice. <laughs> cool. Now, we have a little gift for you too. Uh, one very big applause because the parents are watching <laughs> and the family. Definitely. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, thank you so much yeah. for the talk and thank good you luck. Very much. Uh, uh, we'd expect the gold medal, of course. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> we hope uh, so. <laughs> good luck. Take right, care. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. We're done, people.